So thanks for coming to this lecture. What I want to do is tell you guys how we're going to structure the lecture so you know what to anticipate. Um, what we're going to do is start out with the lecture part. And what I'm going to do is just plow through tons of information. So I would just say if you guys have a question, just write it down in your notebook and then let's save it for the very end because if people are asking questions during the lecture, it just starts to get really fractured. So then what I'll do after that is um, if anybody here has an Instagram account that they'd be willing to let me critique, I'd be happy to do that. I think Judy's maybe yeah. wanting to do that. <laughs> um, and I have other Instagrams that I'll show you guys as well, but I find it very useful to have the artist here so they can tell us about their approach and about um, what they've been struggling with or what they're trying to do with their social media account. And then at the very end, we'll have plenty of time for questions. So um, feel free to um, ask me anything. And just so you guys know, next Thursday, at the same time, I'm doing another lecture. And that one is about websites. Because you'll find what will happen today is inevitably, when you talk about social media, you sort of have to talk about websites and vice versa. So maybe not everybody can come, but I really recommend that because they're really good pairing of lectures because they have so much to do with each other. And actually, if you can't make it to next week, I am giving the websites lecture at the Fitchburg Art Museum, I believe, in October. So you can also sign up on my mailing list where I have local events. If you guys want to know about that, I have announcements about my website. This is the Boston area mailing list, so it's very particular to stuff that's around this area. I have business cards up here, so if you guys need anything, just um, let me know. Okay, let's dig into this. So let's talk about this mysterious world of social media for visual artists. So my name is Clara Liu, and I am an adjunct professor at the Rhode Island School of Design, where I've taught for over a decade. I'm a fine artist. I work mostly in drawing, printmaking, and sculpture. I also run artprof.org, which is a free website that has video tutorials and pro development resources. Everything one-stop place for anything a visual artist needs. Um, that site's been live for about a year and a half. So I'm a funny combination in that I really know intimately what it means to work as a visual artist, but I also know a lot about social media and building websites. And that's largely because of artprof.org, because I had to do all that. And then one day I realized, oh my god, I know a lot about this stuff. Maybe I should start telling other people so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. OK, so let's dig in. So the first thing I want to be clear about is what is the relationship between social media and your website? Because you really do have to have both. You shouldn't just have one. They really come hand in hand. The way to think about it, your website is like an archive. It, it's a file cabinet. It's like you need that file cabinet. You don't look at it every single day, but it will come in handy. You can also think about your website almost like it's your career retrospective. So it has your finished work, it has your work looking very formal, very polished, it has your CV in it, it has links to your social media and stuff like that. So the website is critical, but it's not the place where everybody hangs out day to day. It's like the place people go to once in a while to really see who you are as an artist. Social media, by contrast, this is the party, okay? This is where everybody hangs out. This is where people check in. This is where everybody's talking about what did you do last week, and this is coming up in a week or so. That's where people go. So if I want to know, for example, what is Sarah the artist doing next week, I'm going to check her Instagram. I'm not going to check her website. If I'm, for example, a gallery director and I really want to know something about an artist, I'm probably going to check both, but I would go to the website first and then I would go to the social media. So that's an important thing to understand is that it's not just that social media and websites are different, but it also depends on who's looking at the work. Some people never go on Instagram. I'm on Instagram eight times an hour, so it really depends on the person. Um, who's looking at it? The other thing to know is that social media is here to stay. The days of saying, oh, it's all over, no, 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 no. It, it's here forever, guys, okay? It's not to say that the platforms are here forever, because there are definitely some platforms that have come in and out. There are some that were really hot for a while, then disappeared. 
And so definitely the platforms are changing. And what you'll find in this lecture is that a lot of this is generational. And actually, if I were giving this website lecture, social media lecture, 10 years ago, I would be telling all of you guys, get a Facebook page. Facebook is where it's at. Be on Facebook. Today I'm going to tell all of you, get off Facebook, get on Instagram. Facebook is over, okay? <laughs> so this is a very different mindset, and probably in 10 years, I'm going to say, get off Instagram, get on this. So that's a very tricky thing about social media is that it changes and you have to tailor your social media. So for example, one person's social media strategy might work really well for them, but maybe not so well for someone who's a sculptor. And maybe somebody who's a photographer would run their Instagram differently than somebody who's an installation artist. And so you can't really put a blanket strategy for every artist. It really depends on the type of work you do. Like I have friends who are sculptors. They're lucky if they have a solo show once every three years. I mean, that's like very frequent for a sculptor. I know people who have three shows a year. And so they're really needing to push that a lot more. So. The thing to know about social media as an artist, it's a very personal thing. It's not the same for everybody. And so the, the difficulty is figuring out, okay, what are the basics of it, but then how do I get really specific about how I tailor that to my own needs? This is what drives everybody up the wall. Social media is always changing, okay? I think it was a few months ago, Twitter, which used to limit you to 140 characters, said, oh, 280 characters now. Now everybody uses Twitter differently because you've got double the space to type all those words in. And the thing is, if you're not on top of it and you're not paying attention, which most of us are not, I do because it's part of my job, it's really hard to stay on top of these things. And if you're not talking to the right people, it's also difficult to know. So I think that's what's very confusing about social media is that unless you really have time to be reading all those reports and keeping track of all the changes and trends and everything, it's very, very challenging. Social media takes time. And when I say time, I mean years. Don't expect to get on Instagram tonight and have 5,000 followers by the end of the week. A lot of people have this misconception, I think especially with digital tools, that oh, because it's digital, it's click, 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 tap, 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 I'm done. It's not, it's actually just as much work I find is any manual tool because you have to think about it, you have to strategize, you have to spend your time well, you have to really um, build something slowly. And I think the misconception is that we all hear about, oh, that viral clip and six million people saw it, and oh, that potter who did those funky pieces made out of their fingernail clippings that they have been collecting for 18 years. Whatever strange internet art thing you see, you hear about that all the time. And oh, I'm so jealous. That person had 50,000 likes on their post. You hear about that stuff, but that's not most people. The vast majority of artists are working it as a slow grind, OK? And that is not a reflection on you. It's not a reflection on your work. It's just it takes time. I mean, I think I was on Instagram maybe in 2016, I think I started. So I've only been on Instagram for like two years or so, and it's taken me time to build all of that. Again, different priorities for different people. We were talking before some of you guys came in, how come those people, I don't know who this person is, they have 150,000 followers on Instagram. And I say, well, because they bought a bot, and the bot gets you all those followers. And, I don't have nearly that many followers, but I know that I earned every follower and that every follower actually followed me for a reason. It's not because I bought a bot and got all those numbers. So it takes time. You've got to be real patient with this. Social media, it's like a potted plant. Think about it this way. If you don't water your plant enough, it dies. I have a couple like that in my house. So the thing about social media is if you only post once every three months, and I have artist friends who do that, they're going to go nameless. Nobody really is going to get anything out of that. You're not going to reap any rewards if you don't do it very often, OK? But you can also do it too often. Like, you know the person that overwaters their plants? That's me as well. I can never get it right. Anyway, if you do it too much, people are so judgmental and so easily annoyed. Like, you would not believe the reasons why people unfollow each other on Instagram. I mean, I have this one friend who's one of my very close friends, and I actually felt guilty that I unfollowed her because I was like, oh shoot, she's gonna know. But the reason why is because she goes to these art fairs and she'll literally post 40 photos in a row. 
So my whole news feed is this one friend, I'm going, come on, come on, where is it? And I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't deal with 40 photos in a row from this one person. I got so annoyed, I unfollowed her. So if you do it too much, you can irritate people a lot. So what you're trying to find is that sweet spot. People don't forget you, they see you often enough that they like it when they see your work, but not to the point that they're annoyed and decide to unfollow you. Okay, so let's get started. I'm, that was the overview, now I'm gonna give you guys the nuts and bolts. But in order to give you the nuts and bolts, I have to give you the overview of all the different platforms and what the platforms are good for. Now again, it depends on the type of work you do. Some of you guys are gonna hear this lecture and go, why am I not on Pinterest? And some of you guys are gonna go, oh, Pinterest not for me. So it really depends on the type of work you make. Facebook, Facebook is basically divided into two different things, personal accounts and professional pages, okay? So personal accounts, you wanna feel jealous of your friend that visited Austria, you're seeing all the travel photos, <laughs> that type of thing, okay? Professional pages don't work the same way. So for example, the personal account, you have to send somebody a friend request and they have to accept it. Personal page is different. You just follow somebody, that's it. You don't have to be accepted or anything like that. And professional pages are for corporations or for businesses. Some artists have them. I have one, but that's because I have one from a million years ago and I figure, why not? If you don't have a Facebook professional page, don't start one because it's, there's no point in it. There's all these problems with Facebook pages, which I'll tell you about later, but don't bother at this point. I just like to give everybody the overview because what I've seen from giving this lecture is people have very spotty information about what's happening, and if I leave things out, it's just very confusing. So these icons at the bottom tell you what you can do on Facebook. And by the way, if you guys have phones and you want to snap a picture of a slide, that's totally fine with me. Just please don't record the whole thing because he'll do a better job and you'll watch it online <laughs> later on. Um, so you can have photos, you can share, which is the arrow, you can post video, and you can post links. Now a lot of people might look at this and say, oh, that's great, you can do so much on Facebook. I actually think that's a problem with Facebook. There's too many things you can do. It's too confusing. All right, Instagram, which is the platform I'm gonna really push with you guys, you can have a public account and you can have a private account. Private accounts are usually personal accounts, like if you don't want the whole world to see your twin babies or anything like that. Um, you can keep it private and nobody will ever see anything. Public accounts are all public. Everybody sees everything. So on Instagram, you have to make that choice. You can change it at any point you want. But as we all know, once that's out there, it's out there. So if you don't have Instagram and you're not sure, I would advise for your artwork, do public, and then for personal, do private. You can have up to five Instagram accounts on your phone and you can go between them. Well, I think it's like two taps to go between an account. So I have five Instagram accounts. I have one for artprop.org, one for my artwork, one for my family, and one for my kids' drawings, and another for my other kids' drawings. So it's very easy to have multiple Instagram accounts and to say this one's for my kids, this one's for my artwork, whereas on Facebook it's just this big blur. So that's what I like about Instagram is you can really like keep your worlds very separate. Now Instagram is not like Facebook. You cannot share and you cannot post links. Um, you can only post photos and you can post videos, but only up to a minute. You can't post anything longer than that. Again, some people might look at that and think, oh, that's all you can do. It's actually better because people are more focused. They don't get distracted. They don't click away. You can put one link on Instagram, and that's on your profile, where you can just put a link to your website or whatever. And I sometimes actually change it every now and then if I want people to look at something. But again, Instagram is very focused. It's very limited. It's not like Facebook, where you, have to, you can do all these different types of things. For most of you guys, Snapchat will not be relevant. However, if you are running a website that is for teens, which I do have, Snapchat is important to have. So it tends to be a more personal platform. It's like fancy texting is the best way for me to describe it. It's like a very fast way to send somebody a three second video 
a message, a picture, you can add friends, um, you can send text messages. So for most of you, it's not that important, but there's a lot of celebrities that use Snapchat. And actually, Instagram stole Snapchat in a way and it implemented the, the uh, Snapchat story into Instagram, and Facebook did the same thing. So Snapchat was the first platform to do that story thing, which I'll talk about later. Facebook copied it, Instagram copied it, and now it's everywhere. So it got very confusing. Twitter is mostly a text platform. Now, technically, yes, you can post a picture, you can post a video, and lots of people post links. But Twitter is really, if you're somebody whose work really deals with writing, um, like I know some people blog about their work, I know there's some people, maybe their work is integrated with English literature or something, anything that's like word driven is good for Twitter. You can only use 280 characters, which actually feels like a lot compared to 140. And it's the same thing as Instagram where you just follow people. You can have a private Twitter account, but I like rarely see that. Like I've seen like one in my life. So that's very uncommon. Um, so that's Twitter. And now Pinterest, I think, is not used nearly as much as these other platforms, but it does have a very specific place that I will talk about later. And it's sort of the same thing, except they call it pins. So the way they talk about it, it's almost like you have a big bulletin board, and then you pin something to your board. So you can pin a video, you can pin a photo, you can pin a link. And so they call it a pin, and then if you share something, they call it a repin. So it, it's a little bit confusing, because not only are you dealing with all these platforms, but each platform has its own terminology. Some of you are looking at me, Snapchat story, Instagram, it's like so confusing. So this is why you don't want to be on every platform. A lot of artists are like, oh, don't I have to be on everything? Don't I have to be on Twitter? Don't I need a blog? No, if a blog is not important to your practice, don't bother, okay? So for some of you guys, you may want Instagram and Pinterest. You may want Facebook and Pinterest. It depends on the type of work that you do. LinkedIn, I get a lot of questions about LinkedIn. Everybody's always like, oh, is it worth it? I don't think it hurts. I see LinkedIn as a place to put your resume, which is always a good thing. And I do know that when I want to find like a journalist or somebody who works at a particular company, I will search for them on LinkedIn. But to be honest, I've never had anything actually happen through LinkedIn. Like nobody's ever contacted me. Nobody ever comments on anything. It, it's really just here's my resume. So if you're on it, fine. If you're not on it, it's not the end of the world. If you want to be on it, go ahead. It's going to take like 10 minutes to set up. So I don't have strong feelings about LinkedIn, but that's sort of the lowdown. So the first thing, if you guys want to tailor your social media, is you have to ask yourself, who's your audience? This is so critical. And I cannot believe how many artists never ask themselves this question, because every artist I know is after something different. Some artists will come to me and they'll say, well, I really want to sell my work. That's my number one priority. And other people will say, I don't want to sell my work. I just want to show somewhere. And other people say, well, I just paint for fun. I just want to share it with my friends. So it really depends on why. And so depending on who your audience is, that's how you pick your platform. That's how you pick your content. It all revolves around this. So do you want to hit up curators? Are you an art educator? You want to reach out to others? Do you want to get an art dealer? Do you want to talk to gallery directors? Do you want to network with other artists? These are all very different types of people. So for example, a curator and a gallery director, those are two different types of jobs. And they all interact very differently. So you have to think about who are these people. And this is a tougher question to answer than you might think. A lot of people get very, I don't know, existential when I start asking them stuff like this. It's always a very, um, really important question to ask. When you choose a platform, there are three things you need to figure out other than your audience. Age demographic. How old are the people that you are trying to target? Now, again, I'm not saying that all curators are 52 and a half years old, but generally speaking, there are not curators who are 21. I mean, there are some that are like maybe in their 30s, but curators do tend to be people who are more established. Gallery directors tend to be a little bit on the younger side. Art educators could be any age. They could be 22, they could be 56, they could be 78. I mean, you never know, so it really sort of depends. Um, profession is also very important. 
So for example, is it a curator? Is it a gallery director? Is it a reporter? I'm on Twitter so I can contact reporters. That's the only reason I'm on Twitter. It's not because I have deep things to say in tweets. It's because I want to be able to tackle NPR's arts desk person and spam them every six months so they can write about me. <laughs> um, content format. Also, what type of content does your artwork best get expressed? So for example, for the longest time, my artwork was all images. So I just took photos all the time and that was easy. That's no longer the case. A lot of my work is now in video. So I have lots of video. I have a lot of um, images. And then some of you guys may have long videos. Some of you may have 10 second videos. And so depending on how long the video is, you have to pick something else. If you're doing 30 minute videos, do YouTube. If you're doing 10 seconds, do Instagram, do Snapchat. So a lot of this is very specific. All right, let's talk about age demographic. So I'm sorry to make very big generalizations, but adults mostly 40 and older are using Facebook, Pinterest, and Twitter, okay? Everybody who's like a teen and a college student, they're not on those platforms. Most of those kids, they, um, they've never even looked at Facebook. Like they never had an account to begin with. So they're not on that at all. And they're only on Snapchat and Instagram. Like once in a while I'll meet a college student who's on Facebook, but that's sort of the exception. People 30 to 40, it's sort of a mixed bag. It depends on the person. That's sort of the in-between area. But I will tell you that this is very obvious. And I can always tell when I talk to somebody um, what their social media range is going to be based on who they are and what they've been doing. Also, I'm sorry to um, burst your bubbles but curators generally do not have public social media profiles. My opinion about curators is that there's some like underground bunker in like Siberia and they all hang out there so that way we don't hunt them down. <laughs> so you will not see them, they do not go to open studios. If you want to know how to contact a curator, that's another lecture because mm. wow, that's a complicated place. Okay, content format. So you have to figure out in your artwork what do you need to post? Do you need to post links? Do you need to post text? Do you need to post videos or images? It could be a combination of those things. For example, I have a blog post where I write a lot about my artistic process. So for me, links are important because I need to link back to my blog. Sometimes I'll type like a longish Instagram post because I have something to say. And then video and imagery as well. You might want to take a picture of this slide because there's no way you guys are going to get this down on a sheet of paper in a few seconds. I'll explain to you exactly what this slide means. So basically, this is telling you which platforms are best suited to these content formats. So technically speaking, yes, on Facebook you can put on a video, but it's not really a video platform. A video platform, let me stand up. These are the platforms that are best suited for video. So like I said, technically, yeah, you can have a video here, but Instagram is great for video. Snapchat's so easy to make a video. YouTube obviously is all video, so you're gonna wanna do that. So for sharing, you can see on sharing, Instagram is not listed because you cannot share a post on Instagram. There is a way around it. There is an app, it's called Repost. So you can do the app. But it's a pain in the butt. You've got to copy the URL. You've got to put it into the repost app. You've got to tap eight times. You've got to go back into Instagram. You've got to ask about the caption. Do you have it? Yes, I understand. It's a pain in the butt. And so you can, but a lot of people don't. So sharing is really easy on Facebook. You just click share. Pinterest, you repin. Snapchat, so easy to share. Twitter, you just retweet. So these are all platforms where it's very easy to share things. Now links. Mostly Facebook and Twitter are best for that. Instagram, you can't post a link. I suppose you could send somebody a link in Snapchat, but it's not so easy. So what I'm saying is these are the optimal platforms for these content formats. And then images really is like everything, except for obviously YouTube is not really for images. So this one's the most versatile, and you can see how specific it starts to get beyond that. Okay, so let's talk about profession. Okay, so this gives you a little chart, and again, if you guys want to take images of the slides, I don't mind, it'll save you some time writing things down. 
Facebook pages are mostly businesses. It, it's like if Tide detergent wants to tell you what's happening on Saturday at 6 a.m. Get on Facebook. You'll, you'll figure out the Tide detergent deal, okay? Twitter, press, writers, and celebrities, okay? So again, I've been stalking, hmm, who I've been stalking lately? Ari Shapiro, I'm really into him. He's a uh, host of NPR's All Things Considered. I was listening to him on the way here. So sometimes I'll like retweet something because I want him to notice me. So um, that's mostly Twitter. Instagram, I don't know how Instagram did this, but it was brilliant. Instagram has really like put themselves on a pedestal so that there are lots of very highly regarded galleries and museums that are all on Instagram, but who would rather be caught dead than be on Pinterest. So Instagram holds this very like esteemed place in the art world that very few other platforms have. So very big galleries, well-established galleries in New York City have Instagram accounts that are selling work off of Instagram, visual artists, anybody who has like a visual field. Like you'll notice lots of pastry chefs have Instagram accounts because it's a very visual field. So that's Instagram. Pinterest, again, a real mixed bag, but I have noticed that art educators are all over Pinterest. Oh my God, they love, love, love Pinterest. And mostly, again, this is hard to define, but crafts, like things like, oh, I want to make my kid a, a rice bunny for lunch so I can make the other parents jealous type of thing. <laughs> You'll see that type of thing on Pinterest. Like, for example, um, one of my family member's friends, she had this blog about how to make cute bento boxes, and she was really good at it. Like, her stuff is amazing. She is all over Pinterest. That's the type of thing Pinterest is great for. Personal versus professional. This is a decision you have to make as soon as possible. So again, if you don't have Instagram, if you don't have these accounts set up, decide this before you set things up. So you have to decide whether you want to keep personal and professional separate, whether you want them to intersect every now and then, or if you want to mix them entirely. For most people, the personal accounts tend to be Snapchat, the private Instagram accounts, and Facebook, the one where you send friend requests, the personal accounts. Professional accounts tend to be LinkedIn. Most people don't tend to post their pictures from Cape Cod last summer on LinkedIn, Twitter as well, and Instagram, when it's a public account, usually that is a professional situation. Um, let's talk about speed. It's remarkable how different the speed and response time is between all of these platforms. Snapchat and Instagram, it's like the speed of light. Like I'll post something and literally within five minutes, it's got 10 likes. And I'm going, what are these people doing all day? Is it just like, are they just tapping all day or something like that? On Snapchat, it's like my students, if I send them an email, it could be three weeks before I hear anything. Snapchat, boom, I'm like, oh wow, you couldn't, you couldn't reply like that on email? So Snapchat is like, oh, instantaneous response. It's very satisfying. Twitter and Facebook, moderate. So I would say if I post something on Facebook, I give it about 72 hours before everything has rolled in, in terms of response. So on Facebook, if I don't get an immediate reply, I don't think, oh, it's a failure, everybody hates me, which some people do anyway. But on um, Facebook, it's a little bit slower. Instagram, I usually get everything I'm going to get in 12 hours. Beyond that, maybe something will trickle in, but the vast majority of the response will be in 12 hours. Slow would be Pinterest, because, geez, I don't know who pins what, when, it's sort of unclear on that platform. YouTube, I think unless you're one of those like vlogger people that post something every day about what lipstick you're wearing, usually they don't post that often. Like on my platform, we only release a video like once every week. I mean, that's very often. Usually it's more like two a month or something. LinkedIn, I don't know what happens on LinkedIn, so maybe we should say nothing, but anyway. I don't see traffic on LinkedIn is what I'm trying to say. All right, let's talk about content. Now this goes for all platforms, okay? We're getting into the more general stuff. We're getting away from um, the particular aspects of the platforms. I would advise to you guys, short and sweet, okay? Most content that people are looking at nowadays, it's on a phone. I'll tell you guys, the only time that I open up my laptop is when I'm writing an essay, when I'm doing grading, and when I'm editing video. 
The rest of the time, I'm on my phone to check Facebook, to check Instagram. Um, I generally do not do that here anymore. Once in a while, I'll sneak over and procrastinate, but not very much. Instagram is really impossible on a laptop, so I just don't even bother with Instagram on that. But I would really advise the next time you guys are out, see somebody who's scrolling on their phone and just watch how fast it is. I'll look at my students. Can I hold your phone for a minute? Literally, it's like, and I'm like, are you even looking at that? Like, and they're like, oh, tap, tap. And I'm going, how, how did you even process that for three seconds? I mean, it's astounding how fast people scroll through. So I know a lot of people will say, well, I can only talk about my artwork if I have at least 10 pages to describe it. And I say, forget it. No one's going to read past sentence three. And so that's the way it is on social media. People have no attention span. On a website, different story, okay? I was a gallery director for four years, and when I looked at an artist's website, it's a different pace. Like I said, oh, here's the artist statement. I will sit down, I will read it, and I'll look at the CV very carefully on Instagram, going, oh, all right, let's get through, like, boom, 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 hi, cool, da, da, da. Like, it's not the same rhythm at all. So social media, short and sweet. Don't get too involved. Look at the difference between the text on the left and the text on the right. And I am not joking, you guys, to say that I have seen that text on the left 10 million times. Hey, everyone. I'm so totally thrilled to have this opportunity. It's been so much fun for me. I've worked really hard. But haven't you guys tuned out by now? None of you are listening to me anymore. Yeah. Yeah. How about this? Solo show, Gallery Smith, next Tuesday, January 8th, 4 6. Be there. You all know I'm having a show at Gallery Smith. Look at this. Gallery Smith is all the way down here, 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Oh, site. OK. You know, it's like you just can't get that information. And every time I do this lecture, people are always like, yeah, but I really want to be more personal, and I, I want people to understand who I am. Like, not when you're trying to announce a gallery show. Do that in your artist statement. Do that in your work. Do that when you talk to people. Do that at a studio visit. But in a post on Instagram or Facebook, that's all they need to know. They don't need to know anything else. If they truly like your work, they'll show up. Trust me, that paragraph is not going to be what convinces somebody to get out on a Saturday night, drive to downtown Boston, and see your show. In fact, they're probably more likely to do that with the one on the right. Finished artworks. Let's talk about where these belong and don't belong. If you post finished artwork, Excellent, simple photos. I know you've all heard this 10,000 times, but on social media, if you have crappy photos, forget about it. it. It's just, it's like, don't even post. Like, I would say it's better to just not post anything if you have crappy photos than to post really bad ones. Because it's shocking how terrible some of the photos are that I see artists posting. They're embarrassing. Um, look at the lighting, okay? So this image here, this is a 3D piece. But look at the crap in the upper corners. Look at the terrible lighting, a strange point of view. Like, why would you want to see this back view with the stark shadow? Look at how clean and beautiful this photo is. It's like you can really see the shape, the color. There's a little bit of shadow in there. It's a really nice image. You can really absorb what the piece is all about. Background color. Seems so obvious, doesn't it? If you have a green base, maybe you shouldn't have a green background. You see it all the time. You gotta think about the color. So the image on the right, it's a grayish, whitish sculpture, but you have a very dark black background that allows that sculpture to jump outwards. On the left, it's like, what are you looking at? It's like, what, what is this, like a waterbed that you put your vase on? It just looks terrible. So excellent photographs is 10 times harder for 3D artists. And I think most 3D artists that I know do hire professional photographers because it is that hard to shoot a good 3D image. Painters, I think, struggle because of glare, because it's a huge problem if you have like a really shiny painting. And actually, some advice that people give me is take a photo of the painting before you varnish it, because after you varnish it, it's all over. And um, charcoal drawings are fabulous, so easy to photograph. But um, it's, it's different for everybody. On social media, scale is really, really good to show. Because if you say, oh, this vase is five inches, nobody cares. But if you show this, somebody's hand holding that cup, 
they really have an understanding of how big that is. So especially if any of you guys want to sell your work, that's so important. I had somebody buy a print off of my Etsy shop for not an astronomical amount of money, but it was a couple hundred dollars, but that's an investment, right? It's not like they bought a $10 print. And so they sent it back and said, oh, well, I don't want it anymore. I'm like, why? They're like, it's just bigger than I thought. And I was like, oh, so I had to like do all this returns and everything. I was really bummed out. And I was like, man, I should have had a photo that really showed it like on a wall or next to a couch or something like that for scale. It really depends on your artwork. For some artwork, that would look so tacky and so bad. But for ceramics, anything that's functional, like this, who knows how big this vase is? It could be 30 inches tall, could be two inches tall. You just have no idea. So any of you guys who want to sell, have work that's functional, that's interacting with something, definitely show that. So you can see in this painting, you have no idea. It's like this could be 10 inches, it could be 50 inches tall. People don't tend to buy 20 foot tall paintings online, but when they do, they probably want to get a sense for what that looks like. This one too, this painting is tiny. You'd be surprised. Like I really thought this painting was a lot bigger than it actually was. And now this is a piece that I did, which is actually a sculpture, which I sell as a print. And so you have to be very clear about that because I don't sell the sculptures. I only sell the prints. So you can see in a lot of this stuff, things can be very confusing with photography. And if you don't have the right text or the right photo, it can be very confusing. Now this print that I did, this is actually the exact size of the exact print, okay? But it looks very different on a phone and everybody's looking at it this big. It's a totally different experience. So you have to really work around that. And this is a drawing that I did, which I really had trouble representing because it's very three dimensional. It doesn't look like it in the photo, but it really comes off the wall, like up to four or five inches. And I remember what I did on Instagram is I actually took a video of me walking around it. And I had so many people, I had no idea these were so three dimensional. I thought they were so flat. And so sometimes the video is helpful to show something like that. Other times the video looks like crap if you don't know what you're doing. So it's very hard to know. Works in progress. So I would say on your website, everything should be finished, polished, sending it off to the gallery type of thing, okay? There is a place for works in progress though, and that's social media, okay? So it's really funny. This is a very distinct generational divide. I was talking a lot to my students. They're all like college age and stuff like that. And I looked at an image of mine, and it was a very polished piece that I had. I'd worked on it forever. I shot this professional photograph of it. And I was saying to them, you know, why did everybody like this crummy picture of my messy studio with this print that I made in five seconds? And I didn't get any reaction to this finished piece that I had labored so hard on. And they're like, oh, well, that's so cold and so sterile. I'm like, no, it's professional. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that a lot of people, like 35 and younger, love this. They love seeing behind the scenes. Because for them, the way they see it, it's, it's like getting behind the scenes. And it's an intimate look into you as an artist. What are your tools? What is your process? They love it. I mean, to me, I look at this, I'm like, oh, I'm a slob in the studio. Great, everybody knows what a mess I make. But apparently, I don't know, maybe it's just because I'm an artist and to me this is such an everyday thing. But for a lot of other people, stuff like this, which is halfway done and a total disaster in my opinion, people love it. They love how much that really gets them into your head. So images like this, where you can actually see the work in the studio space, also really great, also good for scale, because you look at those stools, you know how big the drawing is. And so actually, the works in progress images are very helpful, and I really encourage you guys to shoot those. It's very easy with a smartphone now, you just snap, snap every now and then, it's not difficult. Really good to have some images of you in the studio. And with smartphones now, it's actually not that difficult, although it is nice if you have somebody just every now and then, doesn't have to be a fancy professional photographer, just someone to snap a couple photos of you. It just gives your Instagram or your personal account, um, or your professional account rather, a more personal touch. Because what I have found now, people really want to know who is the artist. And oftentimes, if I go to a website and there's no photo of the artist, I'm not interested because it feels anonymous, it feels evasive, it makes me think that 
they're not a real person somehow. I don't know, it's hard to describe. So it's really nice to have just something casual like this, you sketching out a cafe. It doesn't have to be anything hyper formal or anything like that, or it can be something like this, like you working in the studio, doing something like that. I find people really, really enjoy those shots. So a lot of people will say to me, oh, well, I'm so shy, I'm so self-conscious about how I look. Do something like this. This is a shot, you're in it, we can see you, but you're actually doing something, and so we don't look at your face. Like this one, which is of me, yeah, you can see my face, but it's not like Portrait of Clara on Time Magazine. It's just like me just working on the work, and most people will look at the artwork before they really look at me. And I think a really nice way to really get people into your studio space, show your hands, because people really love to see the tools. They want to see what kind of paints you use. What do your brushes look like? What kind of paper are you using? So if you can get some nice close-up shots, it doesn't have to be both hands. I mean, you can be doing something with one hand and snap quick photos, so that way you don't need somebody there to do it. But again, it gives you that intimate look, mm -hmm. and it also, again, gives a sense of scale. So you know about how big things are. Um, I oftentimes, because I'm an educator, I shoot photos of students doing pieces in my classroom so you can get a feel for the process a little bit more. So these are really great to have, especially something like printmaking. Printmaking, in my opinion, it's a very mysterious um, medium for a lot of people. A lot of people don't really know what a printmaking press is or how Intaglio printmaking works. So when I show people an image like that, they get it right away. I don't have to say, so in Intaglio printmaking, a copper plate is taken and then beveled and then pushed through a press. It's like nobody wants to read that. You show this image, people get it immediately. So you can see a lot, this one is my hands and this one is my hands as well. And so that also, I think, shows the diversity of an artist. So for example, I work in printmaking, I also work in sculpture, and so I have a lot of tools in my house and it's nice to be able to see that. It's also good if you have pictures of yourself in a professional context, um, not you sipping on margarita by the side of the pool. Some of you may feel, oh, well that enhances my artistic practice. No, it doesn't. You look like an idiot. Please don't do that. <laughs> Put it in your personal feed. I'm sure your friends will appreciate it. But I just know that for me, when I start seeing really personal pictures like that, it drives me up the wall. Like actually, I have a bunch of RISD students who I follow who have graduated. I follow them on Instagram. I had one student who kept posting these like really racy photos of herself. And I was like, I'm not gonna follow you anymore. Right? Because like she posts paintings, but then they started being more pictures of her and I lost interest because I was like, I don't need to see another picture of you half naked. It's just not mm -hmm. interesting to me. So professional context. So these are some portfolio reviews. I saw images of me teaching in the classroom. It's another way to get a photo of you in a context where people can see you actually in action doing something. Now, I know not everybody lectures or teaches necessarily, but you can have you at your gallery opening, you in the studio, you talking with an artist friend. There's so many different ways you can put yourself in a professional context. Exhibitions, if any of you guys are in shows, you can show the pieces in the gallery context. Um, so this was a solo show I had at Framingham State. I do think it's nice to have some that are just the artwork with nobody in it. Because like, you know when you go to these art openings to like see your friend's work and you're like, oh, I don't know what was in your show. I guess I have to go again. And so if I go to a friend's show, I'll go to the opening and then I'll go to the show again later because I can never see anything in the opening. It's like so crowded. You can't see the work clearly. But then I'll also include images from the opening, again for scale, because now from looking at these, you guys know how big my artwork is. You have to be a little careful though, you don't want to have like someone's face like right in the picture. Number one, because I don't think that's hot to post such a clear image of somebody and not get their permission. I feel like stuff like this is fine, it's like people's backs. Someone asked me about the guy on the left, he's a gallery director, I knew he wouldn't care. So what I just do is I either crop people out or I take 50 photos and I use two. So there's ways to do that without um, making it really obvious who somebody is. So um, nice to have those images. Another thing about social media that you have to do, and I know it's really time consuming and tedious, you've got to interact. I think a lot of people think that, okay, I'll do my Instagram, I'll shoot my fabulous photos, I'll do all the strategy and everything, boom, I'm done. 
you're not. <laughs> you're just getting started. You've got to interact. You've got to comment. You've got to like. You've got to follow. You've got to do all those things, and you've got to do them all the time. I don't mean like eight times a day, but you can't comment once a month and hope to get any rewards from that. You just won't. You will get what you put into it. And what I'll tell you guys, of course, the most time-consuming way to get attention, but the most effective way to get attention is commenting. So on Instagram, these are your notifications, this little red thing that pops up when you open Instagram. So if you don't use Instagram, I'm just going to explain this. This symbol means followers. So if this pops up, it means, oh, I just gained two followers, okay? I don't tend to care about that because I'm like, oh, whatever. And then 36 likes. 36 likes came through. I don't care about that either. Sometimes I look at the number, I'm like, hmm, that's a lot. Okay, whatever. But when I see this, I read it every single time. Okay, I'm not Lady Gaga. I'm sure Lady Gaga does not do that. But I do read them because I have a small enough following that that actually matters to me. So if you comment on somebody's Instagram, they're going to look at it. In fact, Ari Shapiro liked one of my tweets last week. I was very excited about that. So um, not only do you need to interact, but you always reply. So for example, I know this is a little bit hard to see, but somebody wrote in response to this, I'm loving my classroom set of jelly plates. Glad you're getting in on the fun. OK, they're not asking me a question or anything. So technically, I could have ignored it. But I just said, that's what I thought. Awesome. Or you could just say something like, yeah. Or you can say, look how cool that is. Like, you don't have to have like a hyper intelligent, well articulated response. But people want to know that when they comment, they're going to get something back. And they remember that. They really, really do. So I mean, again, if you're contacting Hugh Jackman, uh -uh, I don't think so. He's got 15 million followers. I don't have that, and so I really do respond, and, and people remember that. Like, I know when I go on Instagram, oh, that person never replies. I'm not going to bother. Oh, that person always replies. Ooh, Ari Shapiro looked at this. Anyway, <laughs> kind of a little bit of an obsession with him. All right, um, hashtags. These are very confusing, and people have all different ways of doing them. I will give you my version. And of course, you can ask me questions later. A hashtag, if you don't know what it is, it's basically a mini form of a search engine. So if you go onto Instagram and somebody does hashtag art, actually I can show you guys, this would be a quicker way to um, do that. So if you go into Instagram and you type in hashtag art, basically anybody who has used the hashtag art, all 404 billion of them, a million, sorry. These are all the people that used hashtag art. Okay, so it's a search function. Okay, so hashtag art is a terrible hashtag because it's so broad and everybody uses it. It's really not very useful. Same thing with artists, same thing with draw. Those are so broad and so used that they're pointless, in my opinion. You can have a hashtag, though, that's too long. And the reason I don't like these is because not only is a lot of typing, but the likeliness that you're going to get a typo is really high when people are typing things in. In fact, I typed in something that was a typo, and I didn't know how to spell it, but it popped up. I'm like, oh, it must be correct. And it turned out there were like 50,000 other people that misspelled it as well. So it actually looked like a legitimate hashtag. So this, um, you want to avoid that. Too obscure. How many people here know what liver of sulfur is? I didn't think so. How many people know what paintings and prints are? I hope some of you know what paintings and prints are. So anyway, you can have things that are so weird and obscure that people are like, what? You don't want to do that, OK? So you want to get the sweet spot. For me, the sweet spot is something that is specific, but not too specific. So for example, instead of doing drawing, do charcoal drawing instead of um, pencil drawing, you could do life drawing. Instead of drawing, you could do figure drawing. Um, instead of pencil, do colored pencil. Or you could do landscape painting or landscape drawing, something that's a little bit more specific. Now, obviously, it really, really depends on who you're trying to target. If you want to hang out with the nerdy Ray Pousse people and really want to connect with other Ray Pousse people, yes, use that hashtag. Absolutely. But if you want something a little broader, do something else. If you want to join the other 606 million people who are using hashtag art, be my guest. But just be aware that that's what it is. And I do know for a fact that this is how a lot of people find artwork. Like let's say, for example, you're taking a mezzotint class 
and I'm like, hmm, what are people doing to mesotint on Instagram? So you can put it in as a search term, pops up here, and you can look down here, this thing will overload, here we go. The thing to notice though, does everybody see here, this says top posts. That is not the same thing as most recent. These are the most popular posts out of mesotint. Now if you scroll down, it gets different because now it says most recent. Okay, so this is not popularity. This is like the last person that used hashtag mesotint. So it's really fun though because you can go through it. Honestly, if you want to like lose 10 hours of your life, you start <laughs> doing this because it's a really quick way to do that. Um, just go through it and look and see what's available under mesotint. Okay, so let's go back up to here. Okay, you need to follow and you need to comment. So this is where following actually really is a strategy. For example, if you are an artist and you really love luring Augustine Gallery, and that's a gallery you really want to get into and you want to you know, get in with the director somehow, follow him on Instagram. First of all, if it's a gallery that doesn't have 50,000 followers, they probably will notice. And this doesn't happen all the time, but I have a former student who told me that one of her friends just kept commenting on this one gallery's Instagram and ended up with them later <laughs> on. That's not a story for everybody, but it has happened, okay? Now, Loring Augustine has 62,000 followers. They're probably not going to notice, but there's a lot of galleries out there that have 1,000 followers or 2,000. Like, that's low enough that you really would get noticed. So you need to follow different organizations and galleries. You want to know what's going on. So for example, with Luring Augustine Gallery, if I want to know what's happening day to day, I look at their Instagram. I don't go to their website because the websites don't get updated nearly as much. I can tell you that I update my website like, she's like once every three months or something like that, or if something really big happens, I'll update it, but not very much. Instagram, I post every day. And so if you want to know what I'm doing day to day, if you want to know what I did this morning, go on my Instagram and you'll find out. So same deal with galleries. If there are very particular people who are getting out there, looking at things that you are interested in, follow them. For example, this is Roberta Smith, who is the co-chief art critic of the New York Times. She must get everywhere in New York City. So if you guys want to know what's trendy in New York City, what's hot right now, follow Roberta Smith, follow her husband, Jerry Salt. If you want to know what's happening in Boston, you probably would want to follow somebody else. So it all depends on who you're trying to find. Some people I follow because I want to see what they're seeing. Other people I follow because I want them to know about me. And again, that depends about numbers. Like I'm actually surprised, I figured this out, the best place to hook a journalist is on Instagram. Because on Twitter, they have huge followings. But on Instagram, I don't know why the journalists have very small followings. So there's a journalist I'm following right now who has like 60,000 Twitter followers, but only has like 500 on Instagram. So when I comment, they notice. And actually, <laughs> this is very funny. So I was trying to contact this um, reporter at the New York Times, which is like impossible. And on Twitter, they have like 100,000 followers. They have like 2,000 on Instagram, kept commenting. And then last week, they wrote, I really like your comments. I was like, ooh. And Solstein knows who I am. And you know something? That does go somewhere. You gotta be patient, it takes a long time, but it, it is something. Okay, or if there's an artist, you just like their artwork. You just wanna see what they're doing. You want inspiration. Tons of people I know look at Instagram solely for inspiration or to feel terrible about themselves, but hopefully it's just personal. <laughs> um, a lot of people go through that with social media, but that's also a good way to do it if you find somebody who you really like. Organizations, um, I usually follow organizations that I'm affiliated with or schools or um, like Boston Printmakers, things like that are really good. On Instagram, diverse feed. This is my brother. I unfollowed him because I couldn't take it anymore. I was like, I know you have cats. I'm sure they're cute. I can't feel anymore. Now see, here's the thing. If you look at some other feeds, yes, some of them are a little bit more or less diverse, but you can have an Instagram feed of cats and make it look amazing. He does not. Every single photo looks exactly the same. And I'll show you some examples of that later. Oh my, well, they're bad photos. Okay, this is Liz, Liz Shepard's um, feed, and she's a printmaker and sculptor in Boston. I've worked with her quite a bit. And if you look at her feed, 
this is all the same project, but look at how different the photos are. Like this is a finished piece, a paper mache bowl. This is a piece in progress in the studio. Here she is teaching a workshop. Here are two other pieces that are in color. This one's a blue resin piece combined with the paper mache bowl. So it's very similar. It's not like you're gonna end up with a fuchsia fluorescent green vase one day from her. You're not gonna get that kind of surprise, okay? However, look at how diverse her photos are, okay? Look at this. Here she shows us a set shot from above. Here she has a video of her scraping a pot. Here she has it on a placemat. Here she's put some flowers. This is overhead view with a hand. Here's another setting. This is plain, just simple teacup. So you can have artwork that looks pretty similar, but have great enough photos that it feels incredibly diverse. In fact, her photos, in my opinion, are so good that half the time I'm just kind of Photo. I mean, I'm not trying to downplay her artwork because her artwork's amazing, but there's something about the combination of photography with the artwork that's incredibly um, effective for Instagram. Okay, so let's go back. Um, we're going to take a look at some Instagram accounts. So um, I'm not going to go into Instagram stories unless some of you guys really want to know about that because, oh my god, that's another lecture. But I'll just show you mine. And um, one thing you guys do need to think about is your Instagram handle, really important, okay? I highly recommend, if your name is not Sarah Smith, that you try to make it your name. And if your name is Sarah Smith, make it something like Sarah Smith Art, Sarah Smith Studio, Sarah Smith Paintings, something very, very clean and simple. I mean, I look at some of these and it's like, oh, fuzz man, I'm like, what? Like, and they're like, oh, but it's part of my, I'm like, I don't care. I'm never going to find you. In fact, I also have people who have some strange variation, like, like it'll be Clara, L-I-E-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U, and I'm like, how many U's are in there? So you don't want anything that's too difficult to remember, that's too long, too hard to spell. Um, and also, you want to have a very succinct, very short description of who you are, okay? I just write factual things, and you can actually put the um, Instagram handle of the place. So I say, I'm an adjunct professor at RISD, partner at Art Prof. So these are both clickable. You can go into that. And I also have one link. So this is the one link that you guys can have on Instagram. And I do change it every now and then. Like, for example, last summer I wrote an article for the New York Times. I changed it for that one week because I wanted people to be able to get to that um, link. And I would just say here, keep it professional. Please don't tell us you like cats and that you like orange juice. It's just not relevant. Fine, personal account, do whatever you want. But in my opinion, it doesn't really look great in that context. One other thing, this may sound petty, but wow, people are judgmental on social media. Look at these numbers. All right, about 7,000 followers, 95 following. What if I was following 8,000 people? What would you guys think of me? How does that change the way you think of me? Do you think, oh wow, Clara, she's so picky. She really, like, wow. No, you don't think that. You look at this and you go, wow, she's got a lot of followers. She doesn't follow a lot of people. Wow, she's special. <laughs> <laughs> Other people, they maybe have 200 followers. They're following 500 people. They're following double the amount of people that follow you. That does not make you look so hot. So that's why when I want to follow something silly, I put it, like, I follow Hugh Jackman, I have to admit. <laughs> but he's on my personal, well, I think he's on my personal account, he should be. But I try not to follow anything silly because people look at this. They really will tap on and go, oh, who does, oh, my students all did that. Who does Clara follow? And then they start looking at the accounts and everything. I mean, it's amazing the amount of depth that people go into for this information. Okay. Who has an Instagram that I could critique that they'd be willing to share? Judy, I think you're in my Instagram. Um, let me see, Judy Brown. Let me see if you pop up. Oh, I don't think so. What is your handle? Judy Brown. Judy Brown. There you are. How do you get a, an Instagram account that's professional? Is that what I'm looking at here? Yes. So you just, you get a public account. Oh, public. Yeah, because you can get public or you can get private. If you get private, people can only see it if you accept their request. So you control who gets to see it. Okay, so Judy, can you just say a couple words about your Instagram, what you've done with it, what your approach is, any concerns you have? I'm going to scroll through as you do that. 
Well, I've done it for about a year. I was very reluctant to start. I was afraid, and <laughs> some friend pushed me to it, and it turned out to be really pretty easy. But um, I do, I don't know if I mix personal when I'm on a vacation. Well, like there, I mean, that was a vacation in Italy, and I, uh -huh. so I have things that are not my photography, but I also have other things that oh. are. Uh, I mean, most, most of the stuff are oh. um, yeah. my photographs. I, yeah. I uh, for the most part, do farm animals now, and you may see the preponderance yeah. of farm animals. Mm -hmm. um, so, and how uh, often would you say you post? One or two times a week. Okay. People ask me all the time how often to post. I would say two is pretty good. I think three is ideal. Yeah. A lot of people do, I do post every day, but don't post more than once a day. I get so annoyed when people post five posts in a day. I, I get annoyed when they post two. Oh, it I really, know two bothers me too. It really annoys me. Yeah, so I don't do more than one a day. Um, so, yeah, I would say once a week is a little bit slim. It's okay. It's better than nothing. But um, two is better. Three, I think, is ideal. So, um, all right. Let's look at, all right, let's go to the top because I want to look at this. Okay, so Judy Brown, 81, that's okay. It's a date that I wanted to remember. I mean, it's... Yeah, it's a little bit impersonal. I don't know if Judy Brown photo is available. She did. Is well, it taken? Judy Brown photography is my website, but yeah. I don't want to change it at this point. Well, you can change it. It doesn't change your followers. It doesn't? Yeah, so you can change your Instagram handle anytime you want. So oh. you can change it now, it won't change anything. The only thing it would change is if somebody links to your Instagram, the URL would change, but all your followers and everybody you follow and all your posts stays exactly the same. So you might consider it. I changed mine because I didn't like what I had before. So. And the thing is, it's not like you have 50,000 followers and it's going to change no, something. No, actually, for you, uh, so, yeah. I've <clears throat> noticed I'm, I'm, I'll have to stop following. So, <laughs> so you might consider that. Um, I don't think this is very descriptive, animal and most other things photographer. Um, Judy was in my class at Wellesley yes, College a, a million years ago. <laughs> But um, <laughs> what I think is really fabulous about you is that you were a physics professor for so many years. Mm -hmm. And I think that'd be so lovely to put in this, like, I'm just making this up and it sounds corny, but like, Wellesley physics professor turned photographer of animals. Whatever, like, like, a, like a sentence that tells me about who you are. Because I look at this, I think, oh, she's a photographer. Okay. Oh, she shoots animals. Okay. I'm not very, but if I say to you, retired physics professor, now a photographer, you all go, oh, wow, that's really and cool. You remember it. You remember it. Yeah. You're not going to remember someone who photographs animals, because everybody photographs different <laughs> things, and that's not new. I'm not saying your work is not new, but I'm saying that sentence hmm. doesn't make you sound new at all. So I would change that for sure. Um, Judy Brown photography is totally fine. You're good there. Let me just look at some of your hashtags, and let's see how you're doing with that. Okay, hashtags, so I find them like um, I looked up cow. Mm -hmm. And so I find the, the cow hashtags and how many people are on the hashtags. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of that way. Well, so one way to know if it's a good hashtag or not, I had a student, she was sort of being a little bit silly, but she did hashtag suave guy. And so this was in my senior um, seminar where we were talking about this professional development stuff. I looked at her and said, did you click on hashtag swab guy and see what popped up? No. <laughs> Let's click it and see what pops up. I just take a wild guess what pops up. I said, is this your audience? No? Oh my god. I'm like, yes, don't. Okay. So I don't know what pops up when you do cows, but you have to figure out are those people that photograph cows, or people that like cows, or people that are farmers, or, you know what I mean? So like, whatever you do for the hashtag, it puts you into a different audience. So I wonder what would happen if you uh, put in cow photography, that maybe those are other photographers that shoot pictures of cows, and that would be better. Um, animal rights activists, I think that's a whole other world, unless your work is really about animal rights and activism. I don't know, maybe it is, but. I'm kind of interested in it. I mean, it's yeah. at this farm that's kind of a sanctuary, and I'm, I'm very much interested in people treating animals better. Well, I'll so. tell you from looking at the artwork, that doesn't really come across. No. So for me, that hashtag felt a little bit out of place. So I would also say, 
don't do any more hashtags than what you have because there is such a thing as too many. Mm -hmm. Like, you ever see these people? It's like, like yeah. a huge pair, yeah. and I'm just like, what? I mean, when I do hashtags, tops, I'll do like five. But usually really? I'll do like three. Well, because I pick them very carefully. Like, oh. I pick the ones that I think really are going to help. Like, for you, you can get rid of cows at Instagram. That, that's not necessary. Um, you can, don't do Judy Brown photography because it's too long and because it's so specific just to you that who knows who else is using it. Like, it's just not as useful of a hashtag. Um, is Weatherbury the location? That's the farm where I take Okay, so these. that's actually very relevant because that's the location. And also, you guys know you can, well, maybe you don't know, you can put the location into the photo. Like, for example, if we go to uh, my Instagram, anytime I do a post that's at RISD, I always put at the Rhode Island School of Design because people oftentimes want to know about that. So, for example, this is my printmaking class from last Friday. So, does everybody see here? It says Rhode Island School of Design. Mm -hmm. So, when you post, it'll say location tag, and you can just tap in that and you can put in the location. So, for example, um, I did a trip to China a um, few weeks ago, and so here. I put in the location Guangzhou, China, so people mm. knew where I was. So location is sort of a little fun thing. I don't do it all the time. I do it when I think the place really is relevant. Okay, the second thing that I'm noticing about your Instagram is you have watermarks on everything. Does everybody see these down here with your name? I'm not into watermarks. I think they get in the way of really? appreciating. I think it's tacky. That's my personal take on it. Cool. Um, some people do it because they really feel like, oh, I don't want anybody to steal it. But if I wanted to steal this, I would screenshot it, crop out your watermark, and then that's it. So it's not difficult yeah. to do that. And then you could say, well, you could just put a watermark across the whole thing. Then it looks terrible. <laughs> so I just think that pe people steal my stuff all the time. I mean, I have seen my stuff ripped off all over the place with no credit, with no whatever. But you know something? It's not like Budweiser bought, I mean, took my image off my Instagram mm -hmm. and is making $6 million off of it. Yeah. And I have so many artist friends and so many students, and nobody has ever brought a lawsuit that I know personally. So I'm not that worried about it. If Target starts doing it and starts making money off of me, I will do that. But it's never happened to me before, so I would not worry about it. Cut the hash. But if you have an art piece that has your signature on it, is that the That's same thing? That's different. Category? That's not the same thing. Like the watermark, do you see how it's on every single yeah. photo and it shows up? Mm -hmm. If you have like you painting and you sign your name, that's just part of the painting. That's not a big deal. So um, your watermark is not that bad. I've seen some that are really awful and that just destroy the artwork and look bad. Yours is not as noticeable, so I don't think you need to change the ones that are already on your Instagram, but if it's not a big deal, I would leave it out because I don't mm -hmm. think it's necessary. Let me ask one other thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, you know, I had Facebook before this, so now whenever I put something up, I just share it with Facebook. Don't do that. People get annoyed by that. So there's a lot of platforms Lots where, of do that. yeah, and it's annoying and I don't follow them. <laughs> really? So yes. So a lot of things like Facebook and Instagram are connected. So you can set something up so that every time you post to Instagram, it automatically posts to Facebook for you. I hate that because it's always like, Clara shared on Instagram, blah, 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 mm -hmm. and I find it annoying. Mm -hmm. So if I want to post the same photo across platforms, I change the text. So on Twitter, I'll write something like, uh, lovely meadows in Guangzhou. In Instagram, I might say, the meadows in Guangzhou have this beautiful breeze. And maybe on Facebook, I'll say, well, I really liked how beautiful the clouds were. Like, I'll say something a little different every time. It's more work, for sure, but people will read it because it's original content. It's not just Judy Brown shared to Twitter, blah, blah, blah. It's just, I find it very impersonal. Well, it so. doesn't say anything. It just puts exactly the same thing on on Facebook. Yeah, which I don't and think I don't is... Have, I don't have an automatic thing that does it. I just, I click on the three Oh, dots, you just click on it. The oh. three dots, and then I get an option share, and... Uh, yeah, I don't like that personally. I just feel mm -hmm. like it's not very customized. Um, I just, I can tell when somebody's doing that, and then I just unfollow one of the platforms. So, that's what I would say. Um, okay, anybody else have an Instagram? What's yours? Can you come up here and type it in, or... Yeah. Tell me what is it short um, or long? It's, cool. it's pretty short. Oh, thank you. Okay, what is it? Uh, Ali, A L L I E. Uh, a L L I E. Cats, K A T Z. K 
K-A-T-Z. And then photos. Photos. Okay. Oh, sorry. Cats. Cats photos. Okay, there we go. Okay, talk to us about your Instagram. So, I haven't, like, for a while I didn't post, but then I started posting, like, every day. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I already have a feed, like, that I'm going to post, like, the next day and the next day after that. So I have, like, somewhat of a color scheme going on, or I try to, so that the photos correlate to each other. Mm -hmm. But I don't, like, I haven't used um, hashtags in a while, Mm -hmm. because when I used to, like, when I was younger, I used to use a ton, Mm -hmm. so I kind of wanted to go. Well, I think what I would say is your your, um, Instagram is very clean. Um, Definitely the photos are a very good quality. But you know what's strange is when I start up here, I go, okay, she's a photographer. She's a photographer. I keep thinking that. Oh, and then I go, yeah. what? <laughs> okay. Oh, th- those are um, photos of my friends, too. Yeah, but so. they look like photos of your friends, like casual photos. They, they oh, don't look like okay. photo, like, they don't look like fine artworks of yeah. portraits to me. Like, okay. I think because it started, it, it got really obvious. Like, like when you get a photo like this, yeah, that, one that looks sense. really casual. I feel like this one looks very casual. I mean, I'm sort of critiquing your artwork a little bit here, but that was my first impression yeah. was, oh, well, she used to use this as a social account. Now it's a professional one. Like that, that was a very clear crossover to me in terms of your feed. Yeah. So what you could do to curate this a little bit more is maybe yeah. eliminate a few. Like if I look through this, I would say this one looks too casual as well. Um, this one I think looks not like a casual photo. Like this one to me looks more like a fine art piece. Um, this one looks more like a fine art piece. Yeah. So that's definitely yeah. something to think about. It's hard for you because these are your friends mm-hmm. and so you can't really be objective about it. But um, you may want to make your feed a little bit more diverse because if you like spliced up the landscapes and the buildings with the people so it was more mixed up yeah. rather than all people, all landscape, okay. it would be more diverse and also I wouldn't go, oh, she changed her account. Like it's, it's too obvious. So try to make the feed a little bit more diverse. Um, Also, I don't see much about your process. Like, I'd like to know what kind of photography you do. Do you do digital? Do you do manual? Are you in the dark room? Um, Are you doing point point and shoot? Are you using your phone? Like, there isn't any picture here of you, like, in action as an artist. And also, because you have a lot of portraits, I don't know which one is you. Like, oh, none of those are me, <laughs> except for my bio picture. Okay, well, so I go up here, and that's you. Uh, yeah, that's one of my friends. Okay, it gets confusing because once you have a lot of pictures of the same person, yeah. we start to think that that's you. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh-huh. Because some of these people only show up once, like uh, this person here <coughs> only shows up once, but then I think this person... Yeah. Is this the same person? Yeah, it's the same person. There's like three of this one person. And so that starts to make me think that, oh, maybe it's a self-portrait. Now, see, here's the thing. A lot of the assumptions that I'm telling you right now are mm-hmm. probably not true, OK? However, wow, people are judgmental when they look at websites. Because when I was training my students at RISD to build a website, I got so much pushback from people about, yeah, but my intent was, yes, but I wanted. And then when we started critiquing other people, this. I don't like this at all. I mean, people were just so vicious when they were looking at other people's websites. So it's really hard with social media to like get beyond your own perception of what your feed is and to see how it comes across to other people. Now the thing is, if you ask somebody who was, say, 21 to look at your Instagram, they would say something else. I'm 42, I'm going to say something totally different. So it really depends on who you ask. That's why this is so tricky. And that's why I joke with artprof.org, we have such a wide age demographic. Like we have kids who are 11 who Mm -hmm. use it. We have people who are 75 who use it and older and stuff like that. And I always say, you know what? If I just built a platform for teenage girls, everything would have been so much easier for social media. But instead, I have to get all these different demographics. Um, Do you have any particular questions or concerns about your Instagram? Um, I do post every day, mm-hmm. so like, if 
I feel like it could definitely get annoying, and since I don't use hashtags, like, recently, I haven't been getting as much. Well, one thing that I'm noticing, it's not just hashtags, it's also the lack of interaction, because I'm looking at a lot of your posts and you don't get very many comments. Yeah. So one way to get a comment is to start a conversation. So if you say something like, um, like I did one about jelly plates, I'll say, who else has used a jelly plate before? And then all the art teachers go, oh, I used a jelly plate last week, it was so cool, right? Whereas if you just post a picture, I go, okay, yeah. what am I gonna say? Right? I mean, yeah, people could say, well, if it was a good enough photo, people would have something to say, but that's not true. I think on social media, I will post the crappiest gesture drawing that I did in two minutes. Oh my God! And then something I worked on for months and crickets. So I don't think I would ever use social media as a measure of the quality of your work because it's so random and all over the place. But the idea of starting a dialogue in a post is really helpful. Like you could say something like, oh guys, I was having trouble getting motivated the other day. What do you guys do to stay motivated? And people say, oh, I go for a walk. Oh, I read a book. So it's not so much that you need comments that are super complex or articulate. You just want something. You want some interaction because that feeds itself as you go along. Um, OK, why don't we do questions? Who's got questions for me? Um. I've had some success on Facebook as well as Instagram. And with Instagram, I purposely do not show a picture of myself. Mm -hmm. I'm 69. N never give any indication of age. I have a completely different audience. I have 20 year olds. I, I'm big with the 20 year olds. <laughs> so I don't want to put a picture on there. I think you'd be very surprised how much people want to know who you are. And I don't think age is a problem, honestly. I mean, I think if somebody really, if that's the difference between whether they're going to follow you or not, it's pretty shallow. What well, did you say? It's pretty shallow. <laughs> well, you can say that about a lot of different things. I'm just saying that I don't think posting a photo of who you are makes or breaks a follower. And if they, it does, to me, that's not a follower I want. I mean, I, I have a very different mindset. A lot of people are about numbers. Oh, I want 50K, I want 50K. And I'm like, I would much rather have thousand followers who love me and who interact and say thoughtful things than 50,000 people. Cool, awesome, cute. I, I don't want that, right? I mean, I think what's funny about um, ourprof.org is that we're not a gigantic platform. We're not viral. A million people don't know about us. We only have 10K subscribers on YouTube. This is another guy who has like a million subscribers and his work is terrible. It's so bad. And if I look at the comments, it's like, Awesome, love it, cool leg. <laughs> and it's like, if you go to our YouTube channel, people really write things to me. Like, they'll say things like, oh, this was such a thoughtful critique. I really enjoyed the way that you talked about color. And I was wondering about spray fit. Like, I would so take that over the cool, cute, hot, like, comments. But again, that's personal taste. Some people do want to be told that they're cute and whatever. I don't know. It depends on your taste. But in my opinion, I think you should show pictures of people know who you are. Other questions? I don't really understand this stuff about stories. Oh, OK. Uh, stories. Let me go to mine, because I did post a story today. Um, actually, Sally, can you give me my phone? Because I actually don't think I can do it unless I'm logged in. So Instagram stories, the idea behind it is that it's a picture on Instagram that is only there for 24 hours. So you post it, and then it disappears after 24 hours. So the idea behind an Instagram story is that it feels more urgent, that people are like, oh, it's only going to be there for 24 hours. I have to tap on it now. Whereas if you tap on just something that's in the feed, that's going to be there forever. OK? So um, let me see. So does everybody see up here, there's all these circles at the top? Those are people that have current stories. OK? So you'll see on there, um, ooh, Hugh Jackman has one. I guess I do follow him here. So anyway, there's like a little purple ring around it. That means they have an active story. And so the thing is, if you have an active story, you're at the top of everybody's feed. Whereas if you're just in the regular feed, people have to scroll to get to you. But see, this is the very first thing I see. So once you have an Instagram story, you're at the top of everybody's feed. Instagram wants you to look at those stories. That's why they prioritize it, OK? So what I can do, this is one of my students. I can tap on her story like this, 
And it's an image that just pops up for like five seconds and then it disappears. So I can look at it several times. Like if I want to look at it again, I can just tap again and I can see it again. So it doesn't disappear until 24 hours has passed. I can look at it as many times as I want, it doesn't matter. But the idea is that this image will be gone. So the whole thing about Instagram stories too, it's not the same as your feed. Your feed is curated, your feed is, your feed is polished. Instagram story, people post silly things like, look at this crappy paper cut I got yesterday for my linoleum block. Like, <laughs> people will do stuff, but people find it charming. And you can put silly emojis on it, and you can put like symbols, and you can tell people what weather it is. I mean, mine is not very silly, but I just wrote Citrusol transfer because that's what I did this morning. And then I did a quick little video of me making the Citrusol transfer. And here are some more. So you can do as many stories as you want. Like you can put a hundred stories in a row, hundred photos, hundred videos. There are some people you, you tap through like 30 times to get through their story, but you can stop anytime you want. Like maybe somebody has 30 photos in their story, you just look at the first two and then you leave. A lot of people do that. Some people tap all the way through. So that's the idea behind a story. It's just you get prioritized because you're at the top of the feed. But again, it is a lot more work. So you gotta do more there. Other questions back there? Uh, well, like you, I have an Etsy site for my mm -hmm. work. It's a little over two years old. Mm -hmm. And I'm still stymied. If you don't pay money, it seems, I mean, I don't know how to get it out there. I don't like You mean it. how to sell the work from Etsy? Yes. So one way, I was just talking to you earlier about this, is to think about Instagram as this like fishing line where you cast out this net and then you haul people into your Etsy shop. Okay. So a lot of my students, what they'll do, they'll post a picture, they'll go, hey guys, I have three prints available, each one is 60 bucks, message me, okay? And so then they message you and you say, oh, it's here on my Etsy, here's my Etsy, boom, they're at your Etsy store. So that's how to use Instagram in terms of pulling people to your Etsy shop because I have an Etsy shop too, which I put no effort into at all, um, because I'm working on all these other things, but people find me on Etsy because they Googled brush pen drawing of a mountain and they ended up finding me that way. Do you put a hashtag in it? Yes, somewhere? in Etsy you can do hashtags for so each you, listing. You have your Instagram. Mm -hmm. Now, do you pay for this for, for the professional Instagram? I no, it's all free. Instagram is totally free. How will you get a professional versus a personal? I'm sorry. It's, it's not professional, it's public and private. Okay, public. Yeah, so I mean, you could have a private professional one, but it wouldn't be very useful. So it's public or private. Okay, so so you set up the Instagram and you want it public. And mm -hmm. so then when you put something on your Etsy site and you click the Instagram icon, Mm -hmm. It goes to the public? It goes to your public? Or well, no, the idea is that you put something on Instagram, people see it, and then you tell them, go to my Etsy shop, and you can put the link in Instagram. Oh, okay. So Instagram is like the first, because nobody goes to my Etsy shop, okay? Mm -hmm. All the people that follow me look at my Instagram 10 billion times more than they okay. will ever look at my Etsy shop. Okay, so I see a trend. Yeah, so my Etsy shop gets very little traffic, but my Instagram gets a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. And so if I say, hey guys, I just put up this new listing on Etsy, people will go to my Etsy and somebody will buy it that way. But if I don't do Instagram at all, I gotta just hope people find me on Etsy, which let me tell you doesn't work. Exactly, so with the Instagram, you, they find you on Etsy by doing the hashtag. They had, I mean, also it's keywords because the, the title of your Etsy listing matters. Like if you just write drawing, Nobody's going to find you. If you write mm -hmm. watercolor painting of a Chinese landscape, somebody who types in Chinese landscape mm -hmm. painting is going to find you. Okay. So it's all about, I mean, trust me, I could do a whole other lecture on search engine optimization. It's, it's very complicated. Now, the other thing I do is children's books. Mm -hmm. I write and illustrate children's books. And I would, I mean, you know, the world of publishing, but there must be some way to connect to children's book editors who are just looking. They're like curators. Okay. They're, so they're in a bunker, probably <laughs> in Mongolia. But what you can do is network with other children's book illustrators. So for example, there's one children's book illustrator who's very, very popular, um, who I went to school with. I never met them before, actually, in person. But we've interacted a lot on Instagram, and they know who I am now.
So you can definitely get to, I mean, it's like me trying to get in touch with Ari Shapiro, you know? It's like, if you do it long enough and you're consistent about it, that New York Times person will say, oh, you have nice comments after a little while. But this, this is where the, it takes time. And it's like, wow, you could spend all day typing those comments. It's, That's another thing. I just say, is there, is there a, some way to get to agents, or do agents ever look at? They're like the publishers. They are hiding so far from you guys. You, you guys are like these wolves who haven't had a meal in two decades. Uh -huh. And they have like fat stalks of meat and steak, and they don't want you to have any of it. That's <laughs> what it is. Until so. you make money for them. Yeah, but you've got to get into that bunker first. Oh, yeah. And the way to get into that bunker, I mean, if, if I were to lay down for you guys my most concise advice about how to get to a, a publisher, how to get to a curator, you got to make some really well-connected friends. That's how you do it. It's, it's all personal referral. Every single time I have had a really amazing professional opportunity, it's because somebody told somebody about me. It's not because I applied. It's not because I wrote to somebody. It's because somebody told somebody. It's not because your work is great. And it's not because your work is great. I mean, a, a lot of people are like, well, if I could only make better work. And I say, nope, <laughs> not going to make a difference. You, you need to be a genius at marketing. I mean, I can't stand Jeff Koons, but he's a genius of marketing. I mean, he really knows how to market himself as an artist. So Jeff Koons, oh. I mean, if you can convince the Whitney to like spend what, $2 million on that hunk of Play-Doh? I mean, whatever it was. Yeah. So it, it's, yeah, it's incredibly frustrating. Trust me, I've been there. <laughs> Other questions? I think we have time for one more. OK, we're good. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. I've got business cards, mailing list over here. I can stick around for like two more minutes if anybody else has anything. So I have like pro development resources. I have critiques. I have Judy. You can watch a video for Judy because she's on. Oh, she's yeah, she is. <laughs> <laughs> Would you be like to Because he just started.